uh, taking classes in uh, basic Christian theology is going to be our first course that we teach in the fall. But we also uh, got in, in the works to offer classes in the history of Christianity, uh, philosophy of C.S. Lewis. Uh, there's possibly some course design that we might do a, a unique course in uh, a theology of Christian sexuality. Uh, a number of courses that students can take, and then they, they transfer those into their UK degree. And so we guarantee transfer credit for students. They take a course with us, they can apply that to their UK degree. They get to study with you know, Christian professors, wrestling with these things, being trained in what it looks like to think Christianly. And then they also, the really cool part is get, get college credit for it. And uniquely, because of our uh, some of our donors, generous donors here, that they will kind of keep the cost down on these things. For a three hour course, the cost to a student is $199. So uh, it, it is an amazing, amazing uh, opportunity to do a course like that. I mean, I, I haven't looked at BCTC's prices recently, but it, it would, I mean, trust me, it's lower than that. And for those of you who are students here and think about a first semester, we actually have a donor who stepped forward to say, I'll cover all the books for their first semester. So you literally only pay one ninety nine and you get three books. So, and you get Derek King as your theology professor. So uh, if that excites you, then go ahead. Actually, we've already had just today uh, registration open, and we've already got the price is so low. What's that? The price is so low. <laughs> That's how the price is so low. You do get what you pay for sometimes. <laughs> Um, but, but yeah, so we have, we have actually started registration for those. I, I saw even just tonight, we've already had our first uh, handful of students sign up for it, so, uh, so really excited about that. That happens because, and I think there's some mention of it in your program, just the generous patrons we have here at the Lewis House. Uh, we're so thankful to have just a number of people who said, hey, the work of what you all are doing is so unique, it's so important. I want to see it grow. I want to see this reach more and more college students. And so, if you know, if you have you know an extra two dimes in your budget, and uh, you think, hey, I can't fuel all this myself, no one needs to. We just ask for you to consider maybe making us just a part of your giving plans as you think about how to use the resources you have to make a kingdom impact, because it really does make an impact. For 18 years, I've been serving campus, and to see students' lives change uh, year after year, it is an incredible incredible thing. I mean, I can tell you several stories just from this semester of incredible uh, stories of God just working in students' lives. We had a, just one, uh, we had a student come who was, um, who went to see a sort of theatrical and he referred to it afterwards. I mean, Derek's been meeting with him for uh, the better part of a year. And he said, man, just the, the questions that were being raised in that, that theatrical production about the, kind of the life and thought of C.S. Lewis, so those were my questions. And I've been wrestling with those, and Derek and others have been helping me sort through those. And he referred to it as a conversion moment uh, in that play. We've had other, several stories like that throughout the year. And so uh, just as you think about uh, possibly supporting works uh, around Central Kentucky and supporting Kingdom Works, we'd love for you to consider Lewis House. On that note, we do have a unique patron at Lewis House. His name is Dr. Jerry Waltz. Uh, you know, it is an honor for me to introduce him tonight because actually Jerry is one of our patrons. And Jerry has, uh, from the very beginning, said, I want to support the work of Lewis House. Uh, Jerry has supported the work of Lewis House and that he was my seminary professor. Uh, we actually met uh, in his office just before I, I enrolled at Asbury Seminary. And I, and I knew it was this kind of love-hate relationship because I, I, I love the guy because I, I enjoy debate. I enjoy rigorous conversation and, and, and debate back and forth. I see Ken Collins over here, Dr. Collins, another guy that I had quite a bit of uh, debating and arguing with as a professor. But but Jerry, unlike Dr. Collins, did not have, or Jerry did, Dr. Collins did not, he had this picture in his office. And this was, yeah, this was the fall or summer of 1995, and I sat in his office, and I'm looking at him, I'm like, this great mind. I get to come to seminary and study with this guy. And he's got a PhD from Notre Dame, this prestigious philosophy program, and all these famous album playing, all these famous philosophers he studied with. And I look behind him as I'm talking to him, and there's this hideous picture that he has on his wall of Bobby Knight. <laughs> <laughs> the famed Indiana basketball coach. And I'm like, you you like this guy? I love this guy. And so we proceeded to argue, you know, quite a bit about Bobby Knight, Indiana basketball, and I thought. I'm going to love being with this guy because we're going to argue and have a great time. And he's just been a, a tremendous influence in my life. And literally in terms of the people that I could count on one hand and probably about two or three fingers and say, 
these are the most influential people in my life who have meant the most to me as a friend, as a scholar, as an example of what this is think as a Christian. Not that we agree on everything. In fact, uh, there's probably been a few things he's going to say tonight, and we go, eh, I don't know, Jerry. But, uh, but that's okay. He is, he is worth considering listening to. Uh, Jerry studied, uh, studied at Princeton, our Princeton Theological Seminary, where he did his in Div, then he went on to Yale to do another advanced degree, and then, uh, interestingly enough, if you if you know some of Jerry's uh, books and work, he went to a Catholic university at Notre Dame, where he did his PhD in philosophy, and he's taught at Asbury Seminary, he's taught at Notre Dame, he is now currently a scholar in residence, is that right? Scholar in residence at Houston Christian University in Houston, Texas. We are absolutely honored to have our friend, our patron, uh, our mascot of sorts, Dr. Jerry Walls. Thanks to Brian Marshall. Marshall was a best man who has uh, been a friend of mine for many years. I treasure uh, his friendship, uh, even though some of his views are a little irrational. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm speaking tonight about uh, hell. Uh, you can call it a number of things. Uh, one title you can give it would be, If God is Love, Why is there a Hell? You could also call it how Hell and How to Get There. <laughs> it's not that hard, really, uh, to get there in some ways. So I'm going to talk about hell tonight, but before I do, I'm going to spend a few minutes giving you my uh, Christian background, my religious background, that will uh, illuminate partly why I have such an interest in this uh, doctrine. Before I do that, I'm going to tell you a story. Why is this thing not working? There it is. Uh, all right. I'll tell you a parable about this car. It's a true story. So, many years ago, when I had this Triumph Spitfire, my son Jonathan came home from youth group one Wednesday night, uh, early. And the reason he came home early was because some kid had set a fire in the water. Right? Maybe. <laughs> okay, so the fire got started by somebody in the youth group. I, I can be responsible. But at any rate, all the kids were sent home uh, because of this fire that started. So Jonathan uh, liked to play basketball at that time. So I said, Johnny, let's go play some basketball. I said, let's do it. So we got my spitfire. Headed uh, down to uh, the Asbury College gym to play basketball. Got there. Stuff was going on, so we couldn't play there. So I said, let's go to the seminary. So we headed down to the seminary gym. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with Wilmore. It's got two traffic lights. <laughs> uh, one of those traffic lights uh, heads down this hill and goes right in front of the Subway Sandwich uh, shop. And uh, we were driving down, and, and I approached the light. And I emphasized the light was green. It was not yellow, not on the verge of turning red. It was green. I drove the triumph through that intersection. And just as I went through that intersection, some guy is coming from the opposite direction and clips this car right there on the rubber bumper sticking out about five inches and spun the car around in a circle. Now, I've thought about that many times. All that stood between me and eternity was that door right there. A split second, and that guy would have plowed right there, crushed me, killed me, in all probability, and maybe Johnny too. But all I got out of was a good story about contingency, about accidents about how small changes can make dramatic differences. All right, so keep that in mind as we talk now about hell. Let me talk about my 
religious background. I have been thinking about hell for a long time. Been writing about it for several years. Um, as Brian indicated, I did my a PhD thesis on hell. But I emphasize that this is a lot more than an academic interest. Although it is an academic interest, uh, as I said, I've been writing about it, thinking about it for a long time. It's a profoundly existential issue for me. Now, this goes back to my early religious experience. I uh, attended with my parents a small country church in Southern Ohio. It was a church where hell was taken very seriously. It was part of the spiritual geography that I inhabited, if you will. Preachers preached about it, took it very seriously, and I was converted in a fall revival when I was 11 years old. This Sometimes it makes me cry when we talk about this, so bear with me. And at any rate, the sermon for that service in which I was converted was this line from 1 Samuel 23. David said, there is but a step between death and me. David. And this was when he was being hunted by Saul, uh, who was out to kill him. And he was talking to Jonathan, and Jonathan said, Things are cool, that, that's not, you know, that's cool to do all this kind of stuff. David didn't buy it. He said, No, there is but a step between death and me. Now, this uh, really spoke to me because I had already felt this time in my life, vulnerability. There were two events that happened in 1966, the year that I was converted, that made an impression on me. One of them was the Clutter family murders. Now, I don't remember this, in all probability. But uh, there was a book written by Truman Capote called In Cold Blood. And it was about the murders of the Clutter family, the farmer in Iowa. And there had been a guy who'd been in prison, and someone, fellow prisoner, told him that this Mr. Clutter kept a lot of money in his house. So when these criminals got out of jail, they decided to go to Clutter's house and get that money. So in the middle of the night, they broke in. It wasn't very hard to get him to lock his doors. Broke into his house and uh, demanded his money. Clutter only had about $50 available, gave him back. Well, that was hardly satisfied with so Mr. and Mrs. Clatter and two of the children were shot in their different separate bedrooms. <coughs> Terrible thing. I remember reading about this when I was uh, 11 years old or so. Now another event that uh, happened in 1966 that I remember very vividly was the Richard Speck murders. Again, I don't remember this uh, in all likelihood. But uh, Richard Speck broke into a room where there were eight student nurses. And uh, he made them lie down on the floor, face down, and took them out one by one, and cut their throats, stabbed them, strangled them to death one by one. I remember reading this. It's Death can hit you right now. We're vulnerable. We're vulnerable. And I'd go to hell. Or die, you know. I'd go to hell. 
That's good at many times. So that was part of the context that led me to accept Christ as an 11 year old in that revival service where the text was there is but a step between death and me. And these events made that very vivid. Death could hit any of us at any time. So the fact that life seems so so chaotic, so unpredictable, <coughs> again, you never know when you will die. And if you die without Jesus, you're going to hell. That, that's what was preached. If, if, if you die, and, and, and you have not accepted Christ in your life, you're going to hell. That, that may be a Christian, to put it mildly. Now, another event that um, was significant in shaping my feelings about this was reading the sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, by Jonathan Edwards. Um, if I recall correctly, this sermon was in a high school literature anthology, as hard as that may be to believe in current times. But back then, it was, it was in a high school uh, uh, anthology. And I read this sermon, and again, I was deeply impressed, and also deeply distressed. I didn't really understand Calvinism at the time. Okay, I've come to subsequently to care about it and write about it a lot, but um, at that time I didn't really understand it. But God seemed pretty capricious. You know, as Edwards preached this sermon, God holds you in his hands and he can let you fall into the fire every time. His bare mercy is the only thing keeping you alive and keeping you from falling into judgment. So this made quite an impression in that one Now when I was 13, I felt a call to ministry and began preaching. So throughout my high school years, I preached a lot of sermons. I don't remember preaching a lot about hell, but it was still a very vivid part of my thinking. Um, but uh, this is a life or death message. This is serious stuff. And the sermons that I heard from my country preachers, none of them, had gone to seminary. But listen, they knew the Bible. <laughs> they took it seriously. And when you heard them preach, you knew there was serious stuff in the Bible. So that's the context I took with me when I went to seminary at Princeton. Uh, now, when I got to Princeton, I noticed in my conversations with fellow students that none of them seemed to believe in hell. So my, my religious background and theirs was pretty different. You know, um, a lot of them just took for granted if they believe in afterlife at all, everybody's going to have them. You just take it for granted. And I was kind of bothered about it. So, I mean, uh, you know, I had believed in hell. I had been converted under fear of hell and the like. And I remember talking to one of my professors, Diogenes Allen. He was uh, kind of a prickly guy. And, uh, I was asking him something about hell. I don't remember the details of it. But I remember he got very angry at me and he said, Have you ever read F.B. Morris? Well, I'd never heard of F.B. Morris. Have you ever heard of F.B. Morris? <laughs> My name is James. Okay. Well, he was a relatively obscure 19th century theologian. And Alan said, If you ever read F.B. Morris, you shouldn't be talking about this. Okay. So I can't ask you about, about hell, right? So I seriously thought about transferring <laughs> <laughs> at this point. I mean, if you can't ask your professors questions about stuff like this, you know, why, why be there? 
by statement and finished graduating. But uh, hell was still on my mind. So I decided to go to Yale for a year, and there was a professor there named Paul Holman. And he read a really good book uh, called The Grammar of Faith. He wrote a little bit from C.S. Lewis, which was, which was also quite good. And uh, I drove up to see him to talk to him about coming to Yale. And he, uh, he didn't like what he called the bright, chatty type of student. <laughs> he was interested in the latest fact. And so I remember you know, meeting with him, and uh, he talked out of the corner of his mouth. He had his arms crossed. He goes, why are you interested in coming to Yale anyway? I said, I want to write about hell. He really didn't want that. We talked. He welcomed me. I went and wrote a dissertation about hell, the master's thesis. But probably the most amazing thing that happened then was he put me onto the book, The Great Divorce, by C.S. Lewis, which I never read before, surprisingly. I still remember reading it. I read the whole thing, the book, in the night. And I remember feeling this sense of peace. Because Lewis made sense of hell. He made sense of it. Well, I sort of done with it. I passed through three years after I went to person Gale, two years I guess it was. And then I went to Notre Dame. And I write, wrote my dissertation on hell. And I developed this concept of optimal grace, which is the idea that God gives everybody the best measure of grace to convert them. That's what he does. So there is no unfairness because God does his best to convert all the people. And also develops the idea called decisive response, which is to say you are not saved or lost by your casual commitments. What ultimately saves or damns you is the decisive response you make the gospel of Christ. So God gives everybody every opportunity on you, and it's the decisive response that ends up saving you. So that's kind of my background. Now, during most of this time, uh, it's interesting to note that Doctrine of Hell was largely being ignored in academic circles. It was largely ignored. In 1985, Martin Marty who was the uh, famous professor of church history at the University of Chicago, he wrote an article called Hell Disappeared, No One Noticed, A Civic Argument. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what he, what he argued in this, uh, what he said in this article was he could find almost nothing about hell in contemporary literature. It was just totally ignored. Disappeared. No one even noticed. Right? It was just uh, dropped out of conversation. 1989, Gordon Kaufman of Harvard Divinity School, citing what he called irreversible changes, said this, I don't think there could be any future for heaven and hell. So he declared it was done. Heaven and hell were done. <laughs> And then in 1991, U.S. News and World Report did a big story called Hell's Sober Comeback, in which it was argued that hell is undergoing something of a revival in American religious thought. So hell's back. Hell's back. And uh, my book was published in 1992, and since that time there has been quite the literature 
about it, and there's lots of discussion within evangelicalism. Universalism is a growing conviction. Uh, annihilation, the doctrine of those who are not saying they seem to be annihilated, that's a growing conviction. And then traditional hell is also being defended afresh. The point of the matter is it's a very lively debate. It has been for some time now. All right. Now, here's the main stuff I want to say. If God is love, why is there a hell? Or hell, and how to get there? The biblical drama is a great love story. As often noted, the Bible begins and ends with a wedding. In the early chapters of Genesis, God creates Adam and Eve. He creates Eve for Adam. They're married. And at the end of the Bible, in the first 21st chapter of the book of Revelation, we see a new heaven and a new earth and the new Jerusalem coming down like a bride prepared for her husband. That's the picture. So the Bible, we can call a comedy in the classic sense of the word. It's a great drama with a happy ending. But here's a question. How can a comedy include hell? So right there in Revelation 21, right in the midst of a glorious vision of heaven, we read this verse. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. So how can there be this eternal hell if God is love? Because a God of love surely would want to save everybody. And if God is all-powerful, it seems, he could save everybody. So therefore, everybody should be saved. Now this mirrors <coughs> the classic argument from evil. If God is all-powerful, he could eliminate all evil. If he's perfectly good, he would want to eliminate all evil. So why is there so much evil? That's the classic problem of evil. And the doctrine of hell, again, is structured along the exact same lines. Now, the classic explanation for evil is human freedom. It's the claim that God has created us in such a way that we are free to obey him, to reject him, or to love and accept him. The same is true for hell. How do you explain hell? Human freedom. But that just raises this question. Why is freedom so important? Why is it worth the price? The answer is this. Because of what freedom makes possible. Genuine, loving relationships between us and God and between each other is only possible with genuine human freedom, so I would argue. So ironically, this is the case. Hell is possible precisely because God is love. Because the biblical story is a great love story as well as a comedy. So let's look at the story from this eternal perspective. Here is the great love story. And notice the great love story begins in eternity before the world is ever created. Notice. John 17, 24. Jesus is praying what is called the high priestly prayer. And in verse 24, Jesus says these striking words. You, that is the Father, loved me before the creation of the world. So before there's any world. Before there were any people. Before there were any animals, before there were any stars and planets and moons, before any of that from all eternity, we are told there was love 
between the Father and the Son. That is the eternal reality. Now, consider this striking verse in light of that first one. <clears throat> As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Think about that. The eternal love of the Trinity, the eternal relationship of love from all eternity between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Jesus is loving us with that kind of love. Incredible. The, 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 the three persons of the Trinity, the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, eternal persons, loving each other forever, Jesus says, and then it gets kind of crazy. Jesus says this, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. You are to love other people in a way that reproduces Trinitarian love. The love for one another. That's crazy sounding, right? But that's what it says. That's what it says. Now, look at this next verse. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him. We will come to him and make our home with him. Obey Jesus. He's going to live with you. And the Father's going to live with you. Uh, he's going to make his home with you. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that incredible? Now notice this next line. He who does not love me will obey my teaching. You don't have to obey God. You don't have to obey His teaching. You don't have to love Him. He loves you from all eternity. But you are free <coughs> to refuse the love of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You can choose not to love God. He wants to live with you. He wants to love you with the kind of love that existed from all eternity. But you can decline that. It's incredible. It's incredible. <clears throat> So this is why hell's possible. Rob Bell. Uh, I'm not going to quote Rob Bell. <laughs> <laughs> but he's right about this. Love demands freedom. It always has and always will. We are free to resist, reject, and rebel against God's ways for us. We can have all the hell we want. I think he's right about that. Now, secondly, the persistent choice to reject love is what keeps people in hell. Why is hell to one? Why is it possibly hell eternal? Because some people may persist in rejecting the love that God extends to them. Some people may, may, may choose to do that. Revelation 3, 17 and 19 and 20 says this. You say I'm rich. I require wealth, and I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, and blind. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him. And he with 
me. Striking how the people in this passage are so self deceived They think they need nothing. But as a matter of fact, they need everything. And Jesus says, I'm standing at the door, I'm knocking. You hear my voice and you open, I'll come in. I will live with you like again, it says in John. I will live with you. I will live in your heart. I will, I, I will live in your life. Right? But again, what this passage shows is that we can choose not to respond to God. We can reject His love and maintain the burden of hell. C.S. Lewis, after whom this is named, that C.S. Lewis, says this, I willingly believe that the damned are, in one sense, successful rebels to the end. That the doors of hell are locked on the inside. And this is one of the big differences between this view and the popular view of hell that many people hold. Many people think that God is locking them in. They would do anything to get out. Repent in every possible way, beg his mercy. They would do anything to get out, but God has locked them in. That's what a lot of people in the traditional view hold. But I think most of got right. And that is suggested by the fact that he stands and knocks. While everybody opens the door. The door is better locked on the inside. God doesn't lock us in, but we can lock him out. All right, third point. Resisting love is what produces the misery of hell. Here is one of the more vivid pictures of hell in the New Testament, Revelation 14, 9-11. It says this, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on the hand too, he will drink of the wine of God's fury he will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment arises forever and ever. Now, I want to particularly notice that this torment takes place in the presence of the Lamb. Now, this is kind of surprising. Because a number of other passages about hell, descriptions of hell, emphasize that hell is a matter of being banished from the presence of God. Banished from Christ, being separated from Christ. So how do we understand this notion that hell is in the presence of the Lamb, the Lamb of God? How does this happen? Well. Let me make a couple of points. First, in one sense, in one sense of the word, we are always in the presence of God. So Acts 17, 27 minutes says, God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. All right? So what this is telling us is this. We are always in the presence of God. There is no moment at which we fail to be in the presence of God. Now, Psalm 139. Psalm 139, verses 7 to 12, reads as follows. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. 
If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you, the night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. So here is a passage that teaches very clearly that we can never escape from the presence of God. He is always there. But here we can draw a distinction that I think can help us. We can be close to God, you might say, in something like physical proximity and yet separated from him by miles. So take this, take this example. Suppose there's a father living with two sons. One of those sons is close to the father and loves the father warmly and enjoys living with him. The other son despises his father, resents terribly the fact that he can't afford to live by himself. He has to live at home. But there he is. He's living at home with, with, with his dad shares the same table, shares the same living room, watches the same TV. But here's the point. He's close to his dad in terms of proximity, but he's miles away from him in terms of relationship. Miles away from him in terms of relationship. So this is the way it is with us. God is everywhere. You cannot escape his presence. But like the son living with his father, you can be separated from him relationally by miles. So here's the point. Our response to God's love determines how we experience it. Here is a statement from David Nicholas Hart. He writes, In theological tradition, most particularly in the East, there's that school of thought that wisely makes no distinction, essentially, between the fire of hell and the light of God's glory, and that interprets damnation as the soul's resistant, resistance to the beauty of God's glory, its refusal to open itself before the divine love, which causes divine love to seeing an exterior chastisement. Doesn't that a striking thought? No distinction between the fire of hell and the light of God's glory. It's how we experience it. Are we open to it? Are our hearts open to it? Or do we resist it? If the latter, it seems like the fire of hell. If our hearts are open and positively responsive to God, it's refreshing water. C.S. Lewis's story, <coughs> The Last Battle, the seventh book of the Chronicles of Narnia, has an interesting description of the dwarves going through the, going through the door of the stable which the other creatures who go through the store of the stable, they find it to be a beautiful land. Have you ever read this? The flowers are beautiful, the trees are beautiful, the lakes, it's, it's a fantastic, beautiful place, the food is delicious, the food is wonderful. But these dwarves, they're angry. These dwarves are full of hatred. These dwarves are always watching out for each other, they're watching out for nobody else, they care for nobody else. And as these dwarves go through this door where everybody else experiences as beautiful and delightful, to them it is described as pitch black, pokey, smelly, little hole of a stable. So they go through this door that, that other people experience as beautiful, as wonderful, as, as meeting every possible need 
And as they experience it, it's a pokey, smelly little stable. Lucy, you know, she's the warm one in the story. She cries out to Aslan. Aslan, can't, can't you help these guys? Can, can, can't, you, can't you make life better for them? And Aslan says, I will show you both what I can and what I cannot do. And first he roars. And then he shakes his head. And on the knees of the dwarves sitting there is a glorious feast. A glorious feast of delicious food and red wine. And these dwarves, as they eat this food, they complain. Peels and bits of hay and straw. And the glass of wine to them tastes like dirty water used by donkeys. So they're eating delicious food. They give them delicious drink. But to them, it tastes terrible and it's something utterly unpleasant. Why? It's because of their hearts. It's because of their attitudes. The same reality is to them terribly, terribly, miserably to be experienced. Now this may also explain, I want to suggest, why the imagery of the lake of fire appears shortly after the image of the spring of the water of life. So in Revelation 21, 6, it speaks about the water, the water of life flowing from the throne of God. And in Revelation 21, 8, is that classic passage about hell. I asked Robert Mulholland, who taught at Asbury Seminary in the New Testament, about this. And he responded as follows. He says, if, as John says, those in hell are in fire in the presence of the Lamb, who in the vision is seated on the throne of God, and the water of life flows from the throne, then both the fire image and the water image are linked to the throne. So here's the point. Whether we experience the presence of God as fire, or whether we experience it as water, as refreshment, depends on our hearts. It depends on our openness. It depends on our willingness to be receptive to God. The same reality experienced by those whose hearts is open is one of glorious beauty. Now the final point. You will have noticed, I hope, that the points one through three I put in affirmative form of statements. This last point, notice I'm putting as a question. Why? Why would anybody stay in hell? Now, when I wrote my hell dissertation, this is the thing that I have the most difficulty with. I make sense of this. I can make sense of how hell can be compatible with God's goodness, in some sense, and his perfect knowledge and things like that. But trying to explain why people freely, freely stay in hell and lock the doors. That I just didn't make sense. How do you make sense of that? Why would anybody choose to stay in hell if they could choose heaven? Well, I freely admit that this is something profoundly puzzling and even paradoxical. But here is something of an answer. And again, I say I got this from C.S. Lewis. 
the book that made so much sense to me when I read it for the first time so many years ago. And here is what C.S. Lewis helps us to see. Hell has its pleasures. Hell has its pleasures. Now, it's not real joy. It's not real peace. It's not real happiness. But it's a distorted version of all of these. And once you cling to these, you can become so used to them that you would prefer them to the real deal. So Lewis pictures several creatures afflicted with this kind of problem. One of the one, one of the creatures, is a man who's called the Big Man. Uh, it's early in, in the Great Divorce. And this Big Man had been a boss in, in this life. He had people work for him, he, he was a boss. And one of his employees, who is now in heaven, had killed somebody. He was a murderer. And, you know, the big man is now up there in heaven, and they're trying to get him to stay. They're trying to persuade him to stay, to give up his sin and, and him to stay. And the big man says, what's going on here? You're a bloody murderer. Why are you up here? I'm down there. And the response was, you can stay here too. To just accept the fact that you need God's grace too. He said, I, I don't want to be tied to some apron strings, you know, bloody charity. And the man says, ask for the bloody charity. Ask for it. For the taking. And he tries to persuade him to stay. <coughs> but he didn't stay. He won't stay. <coughs> and here is what here is what we read describing the big man's response. So that's the trick, is it? Shouted the ghost, <coughs> outwardly bitter, and yet I thought there was a kind of triumph in his voice. It had been entreated. It could make a refusal, and this seemed to it a kind of advantage. Kind of advantage. I've been asked. They're trying to persuade me. They want me to stay, but I can turn them down. I can turn them down. I thought there would be some damn nonsense. It's all a click. It's all a bloody click. Tell them I'm not coming, see? I'd rather be damned than go along with you. I came here to get my rights, see? Not to go sniveling alone in charity, tied onto your apron strings. If they are too fine to have me without you, I'll go home. I was at last night. It was almost happy. Now that it could, in a sense, now, I'll just say, if you've never felt this before, you're a saint. <laughs> but the rest of us can see ourselves in these characters in the great divorce, I'm sorry to say. But notice, again, there's a shadowy imitation of the real thing, of real joy, of real pleasure, of real triumph, of real happiness. It's not real happiness, it's almost happy. And the suggestion is, these kinds of feelings, these kinds of psychological dynamics can explain 
why people choose to remain in hell even if given every opportunity. Can you forgive Can you enter the joy of God? So in conclusion, let me quote C.S. Lewis one more time. It's just, this is Lewis House, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, Thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, Thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. Without that, without that self-choice, there could be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Two kinds of people at the end. It's our choice. Which we will be and whether it will be heaven or hell for us.